This is very much an overview of the situation in Australia. I have given presentations on Australia before, and I think on average I've overestimated people's understanding of what happens in Australia, other than it's a long way away that likes calling its famous animals after the letter K for koalas and kangaroos. Um, the first uh, point is really just to establish that I'm not some fraud coming to speak about Australia, even though I work in London, I am Australian and have studied in Australia, so at least I should have some understanding of it, you can judge at the end of the presentation. So the focus of my presentation will be on the individuation of personal injury damages uh, awarded for a tort or delict, but the rules are largely the same, whether the action is brought in tort contract or for breach of a statute. It's also the same largely irrespective of whether the basis of liability is in attention, fault or strict liability. There are some legislative exceptions and there are also some exceptions for torts of intention, but that's largely accurate. Now, some structural features. Um, Australia is a uh, federation, a constitutional federation and tort law, as for all private law, is a matter for the states and territories, of which there are, there are eight, there are nine including the Commonwealth, but it has very little limited jurisdiction. So this is really uh, a matter for state and territory law. Now, if a federal head of power can be found, then the federal government can legislate on matters to cover the same ground as private law, including damages. For example, the Australian consumer law, but only as it relates to corporations, because corporations is a power that's given to the federal government. No. Um, the Australian Consumer Law, as it, as it applies to non-corporations, is a matter for state law. Now, at common law, in Australia is a system that's based on the English system, so we use a common law system or case law. Uniformity in private law was kept and is kept through the position of the High Court of Australia as the apex or court, and it's a court of uh, general appellate jurisdiction. So unlike the United States Supreme Court that doesn't always get to hear tort claims, our High Court does, and its decisions are binding on all the other courts in the system. So in, in that way, we can talk about a unified common law of Australia. Unfortunately, each state and territory can legislate their own laws, which can override the decisions of the High Court of Australia. And in the area of tort law, and in particularly damages of personal injury, they have done so extensively. And so the result is that the individuation of personal injury damages in Australia is highly fragmented. Just as an example for fault-based liability, there are now similar but different regimes for accidents at work, accidents involving motor vehicles and other accidents in every state and territory. So we have 24 different regimes just in that area. When you combine that with common law rules for, um, common law uh, rules for, oh, what's gone backwards? Oh, sorry. Um, yes, there are, um, there are some uh, common law rules which still are, are, are apply for torts of inattention and what I was wanting to get onto. There are also a series of no fault regimes as well, uh, primarily workers' compensation and some forms of motor accident insurance as well. And so the consequence and the takeaway is that there are in fact many Australians for this purpose, not one. So when people talk about Australian law, in private law, that's always a slight misconception. It's always going to be the law of the states and the territories. Okay, so that's the structural background. Let's get to some general rules. Um, this is, some of this will be very similar to English law, for those of you who are familiar with that system. So damages for personal injury are assessed on a compensatory basis. And the principle is full compensation. That's the stated aim. Uh, but as we'll see, the method of assessment rarely achieves this aim. In fact, a famous 
judge who, who was English, but the same principle applies to Australia, said, uh, one said famously, the only thing we can be sure about is that the final um, assessment will be inaccurate. Damages are usually assessed as a lump sum rather than as a periodical payment. Now in Australia, there are very limited exceptions to this rule, much more limited than in England and Wales. There are some exceptions for dust diseases. We can talk about that later, but essentially it's a lump sum system. Damages are awarded once and for all at the uh, end of the trial. And there is no monitoring by the court of how the lump sum is spent. So there's no guarantee that the plaintiff will spend the award on the losses for which damages have been uh, awarded. So the heads of damage for which a plaintiff can claim, can claim compensation in action for damages to personal injury, well, these will be pretty standard amongst legal systems. There are two main heads of damages in an award of personal injury damages, pecuniary and non pecuniary or non-economic loss. Um, for practical reasons, there can also be a separation on the basis of special and general damages, as we heard this morning, broadly uh, between losses that can be assessed with certainty at the date of the trial and those that uh, uh, cannot. And in the first category, often it's pre-trial medical expenses is the, would uh, fall within that category. How do we assess? So in Australia, it's damages for loss of earning capacity, not for loss of earnings as it is in the English system, although that might be a difference in terminology rather than uh, substance. This involves a comparison between the earning capacity of a plaintiff before and after the tort. So it's damages for net loss of earning capacity. And this is famously illustrated in an Australian case called McCracken Melbourne Storm Rugby League Football Club. Mr. Moe Kraken was a professional rugby league player or sports person, and he suffered a serious injury in a, in a game caused by another player, in fact. And he sued, and one of his heads of damage was for a loss of our future earning capacity. Unfortunately for Mr. McCracken, it turned out he was a much better property developer than he was a professional football player. He earned more money from uh, developing properties, so he got nothing for loss of future earning capacity. Um, existing employment is a good evidence of earning uh, capacity, but it's not the only measure because clearly there, there will be plaintiffs for whom that's not um, evidence of their earning capacity, like students and unemployed. It's a wonderful way to get students engaged in this area. If you tell them what do they think their um, earning capacity should be measured by, and if you'd say the salary you're earning now it tends to get them thinking about the idea, or perhaps it's for loss of earning capacity, not for loss of earnings. Um, but we do have this residual category. I was talking about working out the pre and post accident earning uh, uh, capacity, but sometimes it just isn't enough evidence. That can be in the case of very young children, but also for adults for whom it just isn't enough of a history of working. And so the courts have the ability to, to award what we call buffer awards. And these are literally just a lump sum that the court does its best. It really isn't anything more than a rough guesstimate. Um, the courts don't like doing it, but they admit at some point uh, the uh, exercise of comparing post and pre-trial earning a capacity is little more than a fiction. So they just do, do um, a general lump sum award. Two other uh, features of the claim for loss of earning uh, capacity. So damages for loss of earnings or loss of earning capacity are available during the lost years. Now these are years that the plaintiff would have earned or but will now not because their life's been shortened as a consequence of the tort. They can claim for loss of earning uh, capacity during those years subject to a, the deduction for what's called the uh, domestic um, for the amounts they would have had to have spent keeping themselves alive during that period, but the claim can lie for those um, loss of earnings during those years. And since 2003 uh, or 2004, it varies depending on the jurisdiction, but all Australian jurisdictions now provide a cap on the, the um, awards of damages for loss of earning capacity. 
it's usually three times some kind of average weekly earnings. I won't go into detail, but I, I can, but it's, it's, it's three times. Now, in fact, that is a very generous sum of uh, cap. It captures very few people, but it is a different from England where there is no such cap. How do we actually calculate these uh, awards? We do it through the multiplier uh, method. We work out the periodic loss of earning capacity and that's assessed. In Australia, the tradition is to do it uh, on a weekly basis, but it can be any period. And we uh, multiply this by the length of time for which the loss will occur. It's a starting point. So annual loss multiplied by the period for which the loss will occur. But it's then a dis it's discounted because it's lump sum payment in advance to reflect the fact that the plaintiff is being compensated for loss that will accrue in the future. The um, our accountants would call it dis discounting to net present value. The real issue here, of course, is what figure you use. Uh, for those of you tomorrow, uh, spoiler alert, uh, it's minus 0.25. In the comparable Australian jurisdictions, it's five to six percent. Now, it's immediately telling you that this is not actually a figure that's based on actual real rates of return. And we can come back to that if you're interested in why we have those figures, but they're extremely high com uh, comparatively. The second general head of uh, per percunary losses is cost of care. Medical expenses uh, incurred can be recovered if reasonable. That's standard. Uh, there is a claim by a plaintiff for the commercial cost of services provided to the, to the plaintiff free of charge that are required as a result of the tort. But all Australian jurisdictions have set limits on this and they're usually in, in terms of uh, two things. One is um, the length of time and the standard is at least six hours a week for at least six consecutive months. And also the amount you can recover, re I put commercial cost of services, that's capped at average weekly earnings. So if, you, if the cost of the services would be higher than average weekly earnings, then you only get average weekly earnings. There's a cap there as well. Uh, now by statute, some jurisdictions allow a claim to the plaintiff for the commercial cost of services that the plaintiff used to provide to a third party, but now cannot as a result of the tort. So this is the converse. Here, the plaintiff used to provide the services to a third party. And in 2005, the High Court of Australia said that was not a head of damage recognised at common law, but at least four jurisdictions reinstated it. But they also have limits against the six hours uh, for six consecutive months. And also the maximum amount that can be claimed is the uh, average weekly earnings, irrespective of the actual commercial cost of that care. Um, two other general principles at play here uh, for future pecuniary uh, loss, which is mainly in this context, loss of earning uh, capacity. The award is discounted by, by a percentage to reflect contingencies for the possibility that the loss of earning capacity would have occurred in the future for a reason unrelated to the tort. And secondly, a plaintiff must also mitigate financial losses caused by the defendant's wrongdoing. The duty is one of acting reasonably to avoid or minimize the losses caused as a result of the tort, so you can't be injured and claim for loss of earning a capacity. If you haven't gone out and tried to look for work, you may in fact have earning a capacity you haven't utilized. You have a duty to attempt to minimize the loss by exercising that uh, capacity. I'll turn quickly to non-percunary loss, and this could have taken a whole session. But broadly, we have three common components which are recognized, pain and suffering, loss of uh, um, amenity and loss of expectation of life. Um, having said that, they're all awarded as one um, award. This is highly regulated in Australia, but as in most things regulated differently. Most jurisdictions now have thresholds and caps and adopt a form of tariff either quite precisely a version of the guidelines for the assessment of general damages in personal injury cases, as in England and Wales, or indeed more broadly based on the degree of impairments like New South Wales. In New South Wales, for example, you have to show that your injuries, uh, your, sorry, your non-economic loss amounts to at least 15% of an extreme, it's called the most extreme case 
to get eligibility for an award. We can talk for, uh, about what a most extreme case is later if anyone's interested, but that's the threshold. Figures, well, um, the highest cap at the moment is in New South Wales, and it's currently uh, just over 720,000 Australian dollars, which on current exchange rates is about 450,000 euros. From what I'm hearing, not a patch on what you can get in Italy, but not um, a bad in other parts of Europe. Collateral benefits, so the general rule is that on the weather a particular benefit, this is a benefit that's paid to the plaintiff as a consequence of the injury. Whether that's deductible from any award of damages depends upon the intention of the giver. Was the benefit given to aid the plaintiff irrespective of whether he or she recovered tort damages or is it paid with the inattention of affecting the tort fees liability? Um, that's a very broad approach, but that's the one that's taken. Some specifics, private insurance is ignored as are charitable payments. So they will not be taken into uh, uh, account and social security and public health benefits are subject to quite detailed statutory regimes. The detail is very complicated, but in general, the aim is not to allow the plaintiff to keep both the award and these social welfare benefits. But um, I think an equally important rule here is not to make the rules too complicated. So in some situations, the plaintiff in theory will get overcompensated because there's a, a time period for which these benefits are considered and then they're not. But that is a cost of being a benefit um, analysis more than anything else. Okay, quickly to uh, death claims. Um, and I'll start with the estate claims. So uh, at common law, there was no claim. Uh, the death of either party to a court to a tort claim ended the claim accurate personalis moritum cum persona. By statute, all Australian jurisdictions now allow a claim by the deceased estate for causes of action available uh, to the deceased at her death, but the claim is very limited. There's no damages for loss of earning capacity in the lost years. So you can't say, well, my life's been shortened. I can claim damages uh, in that period. That doesn't survive for the benefit of the estate. Perhaps more controversially, there are no damages for non-pecuniary loss available to the estate. There is a really interesting history on that. I would say that I've just spent a couple of years uh, researching it, but it is actually quite interesting. That's different from the you know, England and Wales. So the consequence is that uh, apart from claims for funeral expenses, the estate claim is mainly for pecuniary losses between the date of the the tort and the date of the death. That's really what this um, claim provides for. More interesting perhaps is the claim for wrongful death. Uh, I say by statute because as in, as in England at common law, the death of a person does not give rise to a claim in anyone adversely affected by that death. But all Australian jurisdictions now allow claims for wrongful death by the dependence of the deceased, where the deceased death resulted from a tort. Who can claim? Well, the claim is only available to the dependents as defined. Most jurisdictions limit these uh, to family members and de facto partners, but there's one, uh, Victoria, which just applies to uh, anyone who is a dependent. Uh, so there's no limit to family members or indeed to de facto's. Now, as in the original English legislation from 1846, the claim of, of the dependent is conditional on the claim of the deceased. If the deceased has suffered injury rather than death, could the deceased have recovered damages against the defendant? So only if the deceased, if they'd lived and suffered injury, you know, only if they had a claim, can the dependent have a, a claim. So it's in a sense, it's a derivative, not direct claim. What is the claim for? So it's a claim for loss of financial dependency it must be both. So the, to have a successful claim, you must be both a statutory dependent for within the class, and you must be in receipt of financial benefits from the DEC. You need both of those two. Financial benefits extend to the value of the domestic services the deceased used to provide to the dependent, which are now not provided due to the death. 
Now this is considered to be financial benefits and not non-pecuniary benefits, but you can see there are difficult boundaries between pecuniary and non-pecuniary components of these services. The, the services a parent provides to a child don't readily lend themselves into a well, pecuniary, non-pecuniary, but in theory, that's what the law tries to do here. And apart from two jurisdictions, there's no claim by a dependent for non-pecuniary loss or bereavement. So unlike in England and Wales, where there is a claim or has been since 1982, only two Australian jurisdictions uh, allow this. How do we calculate the award? Uh, well, it's essentially done as the same in the same way as for a living plaintiff. Uh, the contingencies here are even greater for a future loss of dependency claim because you've got uncertainties relating both to, for example, how long the deceased might live or be able to provide a dependency, and again, how long the dependent might live and uh, whether they will be in need of dependency or have a dependency going forward. So there are quite significant discounts in this type of case. There are, of course, special considerations affecting claims by minors because the dependency normally would be expected to end at some period. Uh, again, I take great pleasure in telling my, uh, telling my children, telling my students that this is going to end at age 18. It's horror. Actually, it's, it could be much um, longer than that. But you can see at some point, uh, if a child who says I'm going to be dependent on my parents until I'm 50, might have an evidentiary problem of convincing the courts that that would uh, be the case. Conversely, one might one could see circumstances of disability or or otherwise where well, that might be the case. Now, in in theory, uh, the oh, amount awarded takes into account both gains from the death as well as losses. But all jurisdictions, uh, jurisdictions exclude taking into account some of the main benefits. Uh, life insurance payments, for example, are clearly a benefit from the death, but they're excluded in the uh, assessment of damages. England has gone further, which excludes any or all benefits from the death. Australia hasn't gone that far, but it excludes the uh, main ones. Uh, you also have some complications for assets which the dependent um, acquires as a result of the death but would most likely have acquired if the deceased had died or later, you'd get the benefit anyway, irrespective of the death. And what the courts have done there is to give a discount for the accelerated receipt of the asset. That can give some quite complicated um, mathematics in coming up with that figure. I'll, I'll finish with one contingency which has been singled out in Australia in this context for consideration, and that's the prospect of re-partnering should we take into account in assessing the value of the, the dependency, the prospects or actuality of the DC of the uh, surviving uh, partner repartnering? Well, this after some uh, uncertainties is generally ignored by the courts in a, assessing the value of the dependency, although it seems it may be taken into account if at the date of the trial, the dependent has entered into a new financially beneficial relationship. Exactly how that would be done would, would be reflected in the discount for contingencies. Uh, that's controversial and it's not done as a matter of course, it's a matter of, of evidence, but it's uh, possible. And finally, to note that's relevant um, for all the dependents, not just the partner, and it's particularly uh, relevant for children of the deceased who might also be expected to get a or may on the facts get a benefit from a uh, repartnering of their surviving parent. So quickly, three uh, takeaways then from the Australian system or what characterises it. The first is difference. There is very little joined up thinking. Australian attempts to pass uniform legislation by agreement almost never work. They start off being a uniform, uh, if um, at all, and then they quickly uh, develop into different systems. The second, perhaps, is the persistence of the lump sum. Uh, this results in damages awards that are best guesses, really, when it comes to estimates for future loss, nothing more. And finally, and sort of, it's been interesting hearing a different presentations on this. It's the different treatment of non-pecuniary loss, particularly uh, not just between jurisdictions for living plaintiffs, uh, but also uh, sy systemically between claims for living plaintiffs and claims arising out of death. Thanks very much, happy to answer questions.